So a few days ago, as most of you know, I look after natural church development for the conference. Um, I had a profile come from the head office of NCD, which was a compilation, or it was all of the churches in North New South Wales who have done an NCD survey over the past four years. And it just shows us over all of North New South Wales uh, the results. And there was a couple of little things there that made me a bit sad. Um, there's two questions there. One is, I am enthusiastic about my church. And the other question is, I firmly believe that God will work even more powerfully in our church in the coming years. Now, both these questions come under the characteristic of passionate spirituality. The score on both these questions has gradually dropped over the past 10 years and in the past four years significantly. On the flip side, however, we pulled data out of that and just quest asked that question of the people under 30. And those same questions for the under 30s has actually increased. Mm. Apparently they are much more faithful and enthusiastic than us over 30s. And this kind of has weighed on my heart a little bit. I thought, what's going on here? Are we not the leaders and the mentors of these young hearts and minds? What are we doing with our youth? They grow up with enthusiasm and excitement, dare I say, see that we need maybe a fresh perspective or even some change. But by the time they turn 30, they've either left the church with frustration or they conform to what we want. It's disappointing and discouraging. Um, I find that um, it's sad that uh, our youth are leaving the church and I'd love to find a way that we can keep them. And I know a lot of you agree with me. Our millennial generation are doers. They are the hands and the hearts of Jesus. They're not afraid to go out and change the world and speak up against injustice. Actually, do any of you remember being like that when you were young? Do you know why you are in church today? Is it because you love God and he has called you to be here? God has called each one of us to be here and to serve him. Not just Ben and Lizette, but each one of us that is here today. And if there's one thing I'm quite sure of, that God does get upset with us when we don't do what he asks of us. So we're going to spend some time in the Bible talking about that today. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open it to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. And I'm going to read about the parable of the talents or the loaned money. So we start at verse 14. So if you have your Bible, well, don't know if it's going up on the screen or not, but that's fine. I'd like you to open your Bible. So starting Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a trip. He called together his servants and gave them money to invest for him while he was away. He gave five bags of gold to one, two bags of gold to another, and one bag of gold to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of gold began immediately to invest the money and soon doubled it. The servant with the two bags of gold also went right to work and doubled the money. But the servant who received the one bag of gold dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money for safekeeping. 
After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of what they had done with their money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of gold said, Sir, you gave me five bags of gold to invest and I have doubled that amount. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities and let's celebrate together. Next came the servant who had received the two bags of gold with the report. Sir, you gave me two bags of gold to invest and I have doubled that amount. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let us celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of gold came and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man and harvesting crops. You didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth, and here it is. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. You think I'm a hard man, do you? Harvesting crops I didn't plant and gathering crops I didn't cultivate? Well, you should at least have put my money into the bank so it could have earned some interest. Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of gold. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and for those who have an and they will have an abundance. But from those who are unfaithful, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this parable, the master divides the money to each servant according to their abilities. No one was given more or less than they could handle. So this is a story of stewardship, but don't think of it just as money, although they use money here as an analogy. It is much, much more than that. It's about receiving something for free and then our response to how we use it or not. So God wants us to serve him, not just with our treasure, but with our time and with our talents as well. Now that last guy was judged pretty harshly for being selfish and self-centred. He hid and ignored his gift and um, and yes, it, it had been given to him for free but he did nothing with it. He was happy to accept it, but he didn't want to use it or make it grow. You can see by the master's response that he was not happy. In fact, very angry. So let's turn over to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. So Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Now, Jesus has just been, um, has come into Jerusalem on the donkey prior to this. And then the next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus felt hungry. He noticed a fig tree on the little way off that was full of leaves. So he went over to see if he could find any figs on it. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. So then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say this. It kind of leaves it up in the air a bit there. But I always looked at this story and thought, what a strange story to have there in the middle. You know, it's just three or four verses. What what could it actually have a meaning for? You know, it seems really harsh that Jesus would go to this tree, which obviously was beautiful for shade, if nothing else, and say, you know, there's nothing here on it for me to eat, so I'm going to curse it and it'll die. So I thought a little bit more about it 
And then when I put it in context with where he's been, so he's come into Jerusalem, um, what was happening in Jerusalem at the time and, is, and in Israel, it was like this fig tree. It appeared very fruitful, full of leaves, but on closer inspection, it bore no fruit and was spiritually barren. So for this, the tree was cursed and died, never to be ever given a chance to bear fruit again. So now I would like you to turn to Ezekiel. I do love the Old Testament. I know a lot of people don't like the Old Testament because they feel it's a bit harsh, but there's some beautiful passages in the Old Testament. And this particular passage is one of my favourites, uh, Ezekiel 37, which is um, about the dry bones. So we'll read from verse 1 through to 14. Ezekiel 37, it's always one of those tough books to find. And we'll start at verse 1. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to the valley filled with bones. He led me around among the old dry bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, Speak to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to breathe into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke these words just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as they had been before. Then as I watched muscles and flesh formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover the bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak to the winds and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke as he commanded me, and the wind entered the bodies, and they began to breathe. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army of them. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old dry bones, all hope is gone. Now give them this message from the Sovereign Lord, O my people. I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and return home to your own land then you will know that I am the Lord. You will see that I have done everything just as I promised. I, the Lord, have spoken. It really is a beautiful message of hope. It says no matter how we look, we can still come back. Ezekiel was a prophet to the exiled Jews in Babylon in the 6th century BC and most times he pronounced God's judgment, but he also had the chance to proclaim the promises and messages of hope. And this passage is a beautiful message of hope to a spiritually dead nation. I just love verse one where it says that the Lord took him by the hand and the spirit of the Lord carried him away. Just the phrase alone makes me feel so loved and so special. Imagine an experience like that. How would that make you feel to be taken by the hand and carried away by your Lord? I dream almost every night. It's a bit tiring sometimes. 
Some are very silly and I quickly forget them, while others linger on my mind as if there's some kind of message in it for me. I tend to write those dreams down and I'll pray about them and sometimes I will share them with others. But this for Ezekiel was something else. It almost appears as if he's really taken to this place, looking over this valley of dry bones. The fact that he says that he was taken by the hand gives me the impression that it was more than just a dream. I'm a very visual person, so pictures and imagery are a way that I can remember things. And when I imagine this scene, I feel that this valley of bones or bodies was probably not an uncommon thing when you read of the countless battles that have been fought in the Old Testament. Um, a valley of bodies or bones was probably not an uncommon thing to see. This valley of bones, however, was described as scattered to the point that it was hardly recognisable as being human bodies. So when the Lord asks Ezekiel, can these bones become living people again? To him, it must have seemed impossible. But then Ezekiel's answer clearly shows that he um, knew that nothing was impossible with his God. What makes that miracle even more amazing is that he was gathering those bones, each one to its right place, the right body in the right place, even though it was scattered beyond recognition. Then in verse 4 to 6, it's the Lord's promise to Ezekiel and to Israel. And then in verse 7 to 8, Ezekiel is doing what the Lord asked of him. No question, just did it. There's one last thing that is required, however, for these bodies to be made alive. And in verse 9 and 10, he's asked to speak to the winds, which he does, and they all come to life. The wind or the breath is an image given in the Bible that represents the Holy Spirit. A force that is powerful, but it cannot be seen. But we can see its effects. Sometimes the wind can feel good, like a cool breeze after a hot day. Or sometimes it can be fierce and frightening. But after this, the Lord does as he always does. He explains what all of this meant that it was a message of hope for the hopeless, of restoration, of new life. When we read through Acts, we can see that the church did not start to grow until the disciples were empowered by who? The Holy Spirit. In this situation at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was also described as sounding like a rushing wind, not a rushing wind, but sounding like a rushing wind. The Holy Spirit was promised as our counsellor and our guide. So he's already here. He came when Jesus went to heaven. When the Holy Spirit works, there is movement, there is excitement, and there is growth. He gives us motivation, he gives us energy, and the ability to do whatever work is given to us. So if he is here, what are we sitting here waiting for? What are we expecting to happen before we jump into action? Of course, the Holy Spirit will only come in where he is invited. And it is up to us to bring him in into our lives and into our church. Without him, our lives, our homes, our church is like that valley of dry bones. When we are in the valley, we have feelings of hopelessness and despair. We lose faith and we lose enthusiasm. And we may try to pick ourselves up with other things, with our family, 
with people, but although we love them, they cannot make us whole. The life or the breath only that comes from one source can make us alive, the breath of the Spirit of the Lord. So what are we waiting for? Are we waiting until we're better Christians? The Bible's full of imperfect people who used whatever they had at the time to answer a call, a call from the Lord. So my challenge to you today is to invite the Spirit into your life and to come alive as he promised we would.